Keep your audio and video off to maintain clarity throughout the session. We request your presence for the entire duration of the session. You may post your queries, comments, and insight in the chat box. A feedback form will be shared in the chat box at the end of the session. It must be filled out and submitted on time. The form will be active only for 30 minutes after the session ends. Please note, the certificates will not be issued if the feedback form is not filled for each session. E certificates of participation will be emailed within 10 days after the FTP concludes. Thank you for your attention. Now, it is my honor to introduce the esteemed speaker of the day, Ms. Radhika Ramesh, who will be deliberating the session on Digital Literature 101, Genres, Platforms, and Reader Engagement. Ms. Radhika Ramesh is Associate Dean for Academics at IBS Bangalore. She has a work experience of 27 years in academics and academic administration. A double master's in English literature, she has successfully completed her Bachelor of Education and holds a PG Diploma in Human Resource Management from the prestigious Symbiosis Institute. Her core skills are in the areas of business communication and business writing. She is currently engaged with the training of students and corporate executives in soft skills and business communication. She has developed a number of customized training materials and has initiated training assignments for professionals. She's a recognized trainer for the South Indian Bank workshops and has recently conducted a successful training session at Grant Thornton. Ms. Radhika's doctoral research was on the select study of contemporary digital literature from Jane Deem to the University. She has also been part of the knowledge sharing programs for faculty members across the country. She is driven by the mission to enhance the professional performance of the trainees with better presentation, writing, and communicative skills. She has a sustained interest to blend teaching and technology. She is passionate and with the subjects of education, environment, and communication. Ms. Radhika currently teaches business communication, personal effectiveness, HR, and soft skills at IBS Business School, Bangalore. She has published case studies on the Case Center UK, and she is an avid reader and sketches as well. Ma'am, we take the privilege to welcome you as a resource person for our FDP. A gentle reminder for our participants, we'll take up your questions at the end of the session. Please post them in the chat box. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Priya. Can Am I uh, audible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll uh, share my screen. Uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I hope uh, the participants, um, you know, stand by and find this short session um, uh, some uh, with new information. Um, I have tried to keep it uh, short. And uh, maybe uh, even if the participants have any questions or anything, we could take it up uh, probably after a, a little while. Um, and uh, let me share my uh, screen right now. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Radhika. And um, uh, my um, dissertation, my interest in research took me to uh, a lot of topics. And one that caught my eye was um, digital literature, uh, because uh, I basically teach management students and you know how the world of commerce has uh, moved into the digital space now. There is nothing which is offline of late, especially when you want to reach any human for your bank or for your any kind of institutions. First, you have to go through their answering machine. And then there comes a screen where you have to keep clicking links until you find your desired answer. And for our students, it so happens that marketing and finance and all these subjects have a very strong connection to the digital space. And when we write, uh, you know, uh, when we write offline and when we write something online, that is on platforms like blogs or uh, there is a small snippets and videos, the information that is presented is completely in a different order. 
uh, you know uh, when you read a book or when you read an article uh, the reader usually has a time to go through those uh, you know lines and find the most important there is a suspense created and then the reader enjoys the journey until he or she comes to find uh, his or her own answers in most of the uh, hard copies we read but there's a stark difference when it comes to uh, the literature when you read online so uh, i'm sure today we cannot read anything uh, online without clicking a few links or looking at a video or uh, you know listening to some audio clips there is no page which is just in black and white okay and uh, what happens here is uh, when you go online there are so many um, you know content pieces which are vying for your attention that the one that grabs your attention is what is first you click on suppose you want to look at for a video on digital literature now you go to youtube and click on uh, you know the keyword digital literature the way we usually select will be the shortest video okay and the uh, most number of likes and uh, with some kind of a copyright or you know the latest videos so this is our order of searching information online now uh so it uh, it was very very interesting to me that uh, i had to teach um, my students in the class about how they could make content uh, which would why for attention because you know they are usually in their internships also they start doing these vlogs and they put up all these kind of um, you know articles on the websites of companies and it's very important that you grab the readers attention within a few seconds for them to come to your website and click and finish the whole reading and uh, you know take in the information which you have to uh, deliver so any product um, you know the product information or any kind of reviews all these things are written in a way so that you immediately engage with the kind of um, literature that is there presented to you so now uh, this was my uh, background about why i thought about studying digital literature and um, i thought okay literature which is digital and which is online and i had no idea i had jumped into a whole new planet uh, when i went into this um, you know topic now this is a whole new world and it has it is quite new it's in its nascent stage a very young young kind of an information field and uh, it has its own uh, kind of uh, you know challenges and the way you navigate and there is so much and so many things for everybody who wants to choose so digital literature is something either you can study or you can also create or you can do both or you can teach there are a lot of things which you can do with this so uh, let me just so i thought we could name it as digital literature 101 a journals platforms and reader engagement i thought even my insights would improve uh, today after the talk and i hope uh, there is some curiosity generated in uh, even in among you okay so let let's go a little um, you know into the history like why literature now many of us when we talk about literature we think about you know somebody from my generation would think about the non detailed texts in our colleges and think of stories you know the some of the classics now why do we even have literature there's a very splendid book that came out about the technological power of literature a few uh, uh, one or two years ago you know it talks about how um, literature that is writing it became a form of technology even before anything was in uh, you know uh, invented at all so you know these uh, clay tablets on which uh, they made inscriptions uh, you know and which was passed on to uh, the people and it was kind of um, you know they were able to store it uh they were uh, the palm leaves and then there were the uh, stones and rocks on which people uh, made their inscriptions so why take the pain of uh, you know creating literature and also preserving literature uh so what happens uh with literature is something that i think uh, we uh, you know people who teach a younger generation should understand that 
uh, literature is something from the life and we are the most interested, humans are most interested in humans than of any other thing in the world. And definitely stories are something which spark our interest. So uh, you know that when you listen to stories, each person has their own quality of a storyteller. You know, some can outright take you into a new world where some are so practical, giving you just the facts and some are outright boring, <laughs> right? So uh, usually uh, the power of literature is that it is very, very inspirational, okay? Um, because you know that it is proven for a fact that when you read stories, bedtime stories for children from a very young age, their imagination develops a lot, okay? And it has a global understanding uh, all kinds of stories, especially today in the world of social media uh, and the internet, we have an access to all kinds of stories. And finally, when we get to see the movies and read the stories of countries from all over, we know that we have very, very similar themes. Uh, we are touched by the same sentiments. We are, uh, you know, surprised by the kind of plots uh, which we read. And we somewhere we find a connection with those new stories, though we may not be able to read. If you see a video in a different language, still we understand the plot there. So this is a, an amazing quality of literature which can bind us together because of the stories and because of the experience that are, uh, you know, wound into these stories. Uh, it also helps us in critical thinking. Now, when you would see Shakespeare's plays in his age, now, the kind of purpose those stories had was to have a cathartic effect on the audience, you know, like, you know, when the villain, uh, you know, does all the wrong things. And finally, in the end, he meets a very, very bad, uh, you know, kind of destiny. And uh, somebody who is very kind and who is helpful and who has done all the right things by the law. Uh, and then you see that person enjoying some kind of positive, um, you know, a positive um, results in his or her life. So the audience had almost a very nice effect uh, that came on to them from these stories. Okay. And even today, you know, we borrow these plots and they are, uh, you know, uh, somehow strung into newer and newer forms. But the basic uh, message is the same. Okay. And uh, the emotional depth. Now, what happens to us is literature is something you can say that is still holding on to us. And, um, uh, you know, we feel those emotions and we all feel still very human. And uh, sometimes you also learn how a few heroes and heroines, you know, the protagonists of the stories, try to overcome these very, very sensitive uh, situations. So um, also, I told you about the universal themes like, you know, the love of somebody, the loss of somebody, uh, hope, despair, okay, and the search for meaning. You, uh, When you read Viktor Frankl's The Meaning of Life, you know, uh, even today, you uh, those images and those uh, the the despair and the, the cruelty the people had to uh, you know go through in those Nazi camps, it it just builds up in front of your eyes and you understand how uh, stories really kindle your imagination. Okay. And then the character development, uh, that is what I was telling about when, you know, we have very young children when they are exposed to our mythologies and uh, mythology and uh, our, uh, you know, good kind of stories, which have these kind of uh, elements in the stories where somebody is very kind, where somebody is very helpful, somebody is very brave. And the children are known to emulate these kind of characters as they grow. And also, we could take some kind of, uh, you know, um, we could feel that these uh, experiences which we feel or the despair we feel, somewhere you find a connection with these stories. And sometimes you feel you can be kind enough, you know, it is okay 
to have um, you know sometimes have had no successes or having to wasted away in despair because you understand that uh, these kind of um, things have happened before in the stories and uh, these are all very true stories uh, which we um, read about okay so what happens in digital literature is uh, when you read printed books okay so printed form of literature is what we have had when you think about literature you think about a codex you know that is a book which is the all the pages are bound together and you kind of go from the beginning to the end okay in a very very linear way uh, probably you have a, a table of contents which tells you what pages on what chapters and uh, where you have to find information but still there is no way you know you can read it from backwards like the sentences there's a very very linear way in which you access information from these books okay but uh, now comes the change when we talk about digital literature so is digital literature another form of print literature or is it a whole new thing uh, we just can uh, you know revisit this small information or a talk when we have finished this i um, you know completely uh, welcome you people to engage in your own conversation with the kind of information being presented to you so when we talk about digital literature we say that these are born digital works in the sense now if i have to create a vlog you know i need a computer i need a software which opens a page for me and i need to type in and save and if i have to add in some special effects the features of the computer will only enable me okay i cannot uh, somehow take a print out of this and read that is not digital literature so the scanning we do and we upload it online these things are not um, you know uh, digital literature so here they say ebooks now ebooks are not digital literature they can be interactive but they still are not considered because uh, sometimes uh, you have the older books which are scanned and made into electronic books so why should we we have all these platforms where they are hosted where you have access to these kind of literary content okay and why does digital literature matter it's because it expands access to diverse voices globally now one thing if you go on facebook you see that people from anywhere and everywhere can go through all the kinds of pa uh, pages all the kinds of uh, you know um, people who want to connect with you from any nook and corner of the world and it has somehow brought us all together on a platform okay it is a user generated content this is what is the um a new currency we all use that is a uh, a person who accesses the information is already enabled to also share or create content that is co create content as we go through this information so what does this do is it expands the access uh, we have to all kinds of diverse voices for example you know that if somebody wants to go abroad and let's say learn in germany for some course you can find this group on facebook or you know um, some whatsapp group where you have students who have already gone to germany and settled down and you can kind of post all questions and find out how they uh, you know went through this journey and what are the things we should be uh, learning from them or cautious about and how do we settle down there so these are some things which are very unique to the online experience and then it breaks the limits of traditional formats now if you look at a uh, digital uh, literature they are nothing like the traditional books we have seen okay um you click you with a few uh, clicks of your mouse you can enter into different worlds okay and um, uh, usually people who create digital literature are somehow uh, connected to this tech side of computers that is they can be good at 
um, computing or uh, they can be uh, you know building code so these people can create digital literature so i have not created digital literature i have studied them and uh, to become technically sound at creating digital literature you should know how to use the software what are the features and what is that finally you want to create so it takes uh, you know a, a whole lot of another level of um, understanding how you would create so you have um, electronic poetry you have interactive fi fiction okay and uh, you have hypertext fiction so all of these are newer types of digital literature so um, i welcome you to the world of uh, digital literature so if you look uh, i just told you that they are digital born and you have to read them on a computer there's no way you will take a for example you can see this uh, butterfly here it's a gif right so you cannot uh, you know somehow print it on a paper and uh, show it to your kid because it will not flap its wings like all of us know a gif has to be enjoyed on a system itself so digital literature is like that you have to create it and it has to be read on a computer okay but this um, opens new avenues for uh, storytelling and uh, your own creative exp uh, expression so you have multimedia uh, elements like you can incorporate a video clip into your story uh, you can uh, you know uh, experiment with colors you can experiment with how the words come into your page or how they fly away or how uh, you know you can navigate through the uh, cursor of different parts of a visual experience okay so this is a very very different kind of digital um, storytelling now um, so the one thing which is very very special about digital literature is that uh, the way you create and the way you consume it so you can also where does the uh, boundaries of an author lie becomes very very interesting when you read digital literature okay uh, digital literature definitely is very interactive and it engages the reader to participate in the experience and that is how it becomes very very close to you okay uh, so let us go through a few features of this now all of us must be a very um, you know um, these memes are really really popular uh, so uh, electronic literature community usually when uh, we are teaching in class when you ask the students uh, for example if you are an english teacher you ask them to create a pressy about uh, you know a information or some paragraph you have given they hardly uh, try to uh, be successful like they are bored okay but if you tell them why don't you create a meme about what was not fun in today's class i can tell you within minutes they will be able to give you a nice picture which is very very relevant to their emotion and a one liner which is uh, you know fixed on the image and it will be so sarcastic or funny that you won't believe how they captured the emotion and their understanding onto a simple meme okay uh, so uh, unconsciously because they have grown up with these gadgets the younger generation is completely uh, you know um, so very comfortable using these uh, devices and um, engaging with these platforms that they are uh, unconsciously uh, adept in creating these kind of small literary um, pieces i could say so let's see if we could analyze some critical elements and how it shapes the digital narratives uh within the broader context of inclusion and globalization okay and uh, we will see how we can uh, some futuristic digital literature uh, features uh, and uh, how artificial intelligence today our chat gpt how it has changed uh, the way we create content and also the virtual reality factor and if 
these uh, you know because the internet is so democratized these days that all of us can engage uh, no matter you are from the developed countries or the developing country uh, you can still participate in this uh, knowledge world um is it okay shall i continue anybody wants to say something hello ma'am you can continue the questions will appear at the end of the session ma'am so you can continue thank you at this rate i hope i don't finish the talk very soon <laughs> okay so what uh, so this is a very very uh, you know this image is usually used uh, in a meme uh, which shows somehow authority okay like a person who has to say and who is usually correct okay so this is a kind of image which is used um, in a lot of um, meme building where uh, it is titled what if i told you and it is somehow you have it is a believable fact when you know that this uh, image appears okay so let us look at this video uh, of some examples So this is actually a clip from a college where uh, Mr. Leonardo Force, he is the professor who teaches digital literature uh, in uh, their university. Okay, and uh, it is open for coders. It is open for people uh, who have ideas and can work with the technical expertise uh, to create these kind of uh, digital content. So. um why should we be interested in this field is that um they can uh, you know uh, which is already even before we think that we have to participate these shifts are being created uh, worldwide okay the way we look at a text uh, the way a society interacts with text and also uh, the structure of the human thought we the way we think that is also changing with the kind of content we are seeing today now earlier we would have only our uh, seniors or elders who would impart us knowledge or let's say customs and traditions which we were uh, you know taught by our own culture but today if you look at um, the, the kind of uh, you know reels or the tiktok world which we live in how soon the trends are caught on by people from all over the world okay uh, it can be drinking up a new beverage or it can be the way you dance to some new music or appreciate somebody else's uh, creation these trends uh, you know they are barring us uh, from these narrow kinds of thinking and it gives you access to Uh, be much more broad minded and immediately uh, you know cross the borders and engage with these new kinds of experiences so the kind of um, the, the thought process we used to have okay and uh, if you look at the reels now you can see as much as reels coming from the urban spaces uh, uh, also from the tiny towns and villages like people are completely able to access this kind of technology and make their voices heard today on these platforms so um it can be a powerful powerful medium if you have to uh, teach kids to be creative and also foster uh, their educational experience okay and uh, you can also study uh, this to so that you know you can also have some kind of professional expertise also to consider it as a course so we have some genres of digital literature uh, there are many more 
for uh, some, uh, you know, a little introduction today, we have something called the interactive fiction, okay? Uh, you have um, probably somebody is creating some digital lines on my screen, okay? Uh, so interactive fiction is something which you uh, engage with. Probably you have to click uh, and read, you know, you can go to the pieces one by one or you can go into uh, the order of the story as you please. So you have something called inanimate Alice. If you go to the internet, you can read about it. And then you have the hypertext fiction. So uh, all of us know Wikipedia and how the links can carry us around to a lot of uh, places on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, of information. So these are uh, links which will take you to newer information and you need to engage like with the clicks so that you are uh, able to navigate through the literature. Then you have digital poetry, which I told you that uh, just now you saw on the screen. Uh, you uh, can, uh, you know, control how the verses appear, whether they are going to be accompanied with by some sound or what is the image that will go through this. So all these kinds of uh, things you can control and it can be absolutely um, an exhilarating experience for people who want to watch these kind of uh, digital poetry or even engage and co-create with that. Then the virtual reality literature. Today, you know that you have these, uh, you know, technology wherein you wear these VR headsets and you are you are inside those um, environments where you think you are one among those characters and you can, um, that is a whole lot of um, excitement for people who are engaging the first time. And um, somehow it transports you into a new world. Okay. And you feel that you are among the new characters. So virtual reality, augmented reality, all these things have uh, made it possible for digital literature to grow today. That is, these things were not created. Uh, technology is really interesting if you can find out. So when we are teaching in the classes, you really know that no technology was particularly created for us teaching in a classroom. But we have borrowed heavily like the Excel sheets, the PPTs, you know, the Word, all of these things we have borrowed for education. And in the same way, digital literature has borrowed all these kind of new technology, be it the virtual uh, reality feature or the augmented or the AI. Uh, digital literature heavily borrows from this and uses it to uh, make their content. So I can show you a few things uh, here. Uh, let me just take you to uh, the different. Uh, can you uh, can you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So this is a very interesting uh, one. Uh, you know, when you just touch your space bar, uh, you can see how these things start. Okay, how to rob a bank. So this is completely, you have not written anything at all, but with the click of a, uh, you know, this is how you are going through the story. Okay, this is one. Okay, let me just stop it. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, the uh, can you still see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So these are images. See the way you click on them, you have new information. For example, this is about an entering a mall. 
and uh, or a space so you have you know wherever you uh, click so this is something you have information being presented to you okay so you can highlight and uh, you know probably you can add your own information so this is how a digital uh, creation is made and uh, there are galleries which support this okay yeah and uh, this is a, a dictionary which has been made uh, which will uh, help people to find their own meaning so when you touch one uh, word you know so rule it has its complete information here so these are a few things and uh, this is a poetry which is generated by ai if you uh, allow it to start generating poetry this is made by johnston and uh, what will happen here is it will go on creating your poems and then you can edit them to your own uh, meaning and understanding okay so something like you know it goes on creating you can see a few lines here so in real time somebody is editing here and uh, you can edit your own poems and uh, you know delete the uh, words and sentences you don't like and you can somehow uh, have your own poetry generator here so this is one thing okay and then we have something called the electronic literature organization uh, which has taken up this initiative where it actually stores the digital uh, literature which has been created over a period of you know 30 to 40 years for example let me show you this one piece okay and um, so sometimes what happens the kind of technology you had used to create this digital uh, literature may not be available to you sometimes okay now you can see this so if you you know it somehow if it excites you like how you can create such pieces uh, probably in a classroom or for your own audience um, you know how you can create these things uh, with new kinds of learning methods so it can um, actually take us to a whole new world okay so you have if you are interested you can go to the electronic literature organization archives and uh, they are trying really hard to actually preserve all this kind of literature which is created from different generations okay because for example look at a flash the flash technology which we had it is uh, there no more today okay or the floppy disk which you used to save your things these things are already obsolete so it is a challenge to prevent uh, to preserve these kind of digital literature artifacts and uh, somehow electronic literature organization has taken the initiative and they are the front runners in the digital literature world so there is a small group even in india who are trying to do these things and some of the you know people at uh, jodhpur and uh, uh, other iits they are trying to build something more with an indian context and you have indian authors also Uh, for example rabindranath tagore's bichitra all these kind of things they have started creating wherein uh, you just don't read it from a book but you engage with it you know this is the kind of um, a new experience where you co-create and where you can leave a comment or you can navigate uh, the way uh, you want to enjoy these pieces so it's completely uh, up to you okay so let's come back so uh, we have uh, generations uh, we uh, usually it is divided into three kinds of uh, generations uh, which 
the digital literature was created in a way. So in the first generation, what used to happen was you had just a mounted computer, which was not connected to anything at all. And you created a few pieces like uh, Nick Montfort and the first, you know, Christopher Strachey and all of them, they created these kind of pieces just on their own PC. So they, was, they were not connected and they were very, very limited in these uh, features. You had to come and sit on the same computer to access these works and enjoy the experience. And then came the second generation, which uh, has multimedia works like you had, you could incorporate a sound now and you could also put in video elements. So that was the second generation of the uh, digital literature uh, field. Okay. And then came the third generation, um, which uh, we can talk about until AI came in, wherein you have the internet and the World Wide Web. Okay. So you could uh, access from any part of the world. Anybody was, um, you know, uh, free to create this, access uh, people's platforms, uh, which were created to host these kinds of stories. So MySpace is one such uh, internet platform, which hosted this, um, you know, software space for people who wanted to create these kind of stories or digital artifacts for themselves. So this is how it has grown until now when uh, the generative AI came on uh, the scene. Okay, The generative AI today, it is uh, such a fantastic thing wherein you can create, uh, you know, paintings and you know how it creates uh, the content, English content for, um, um, you know, uh, for all kinds of uh, questions we may have. And uh, it is kind of concerning for some of us as well as exciting in the same way because we are worried if this is going to take away our own uh, creativity. So this was a question which was rife in everybody's mind. Now, every time a technology comes around, we are worried like when the automated self-driving cars came on the scene, everybody was thinking, now what is going to happen to people who just drive cars as a profession? But you know, this is not the case, right? So whenever we have a new technology on the block and we adapt to it and newer kind of avenues come up. So uh, there was, uh, you know, a big, uh, a kind of anticipation or I can say that people were quite apprehensive to thinking that now what is the job of an author anymore? You know, uh, why do we need to teach writing anymore in classes? Because this is just going to, throw up everything what we want in seconds. But it looks like on its own, uh, the chat GPT or, you know, any kind of a generative model is not very uh, exciting or it is not very impressive, if I would say, because on its own, if you give it very neutral questions, it gives us very, very bland content. Only when you are creative enough to post new kinds of, uh, you know, questions and creatively ask it, you ask it to take a role and give it enough instructions is that when you can uh, somehow allow it to uh, create a structure which is of some interest to you. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, very, very limited questions or limited queries, you know, what is the kind of answer that is coming around. So uh, all these things, so uh, we have uh, some textbooks here if you are interested. So uh, this is uh, Miss Catherine who uh, wrote the very first book and this is written by Scott Redberg, uh, which is almost like a textbook for digital literature if you are interested in. It is available on Kindle if you are interested. Uh, so uh, let's... So now, uh, again, coming back to why should we study it? Okay. Um, it has a very, it is at the very nascent stage. So if you are venturing into this digital literature platform, probably you will make your own space. Okay. Uh, your own creativity with your own, um, you know, uh, signature 
and you will have created your own space and the way you can connect to people to audiences uh, is completely up to you it is kind of a democratized uh, space which is very very different from the print literature so all of us know when uh, books were printed how much we would be uh, you know um, dependent on the publishers to get the kind of works printed so from a long time if you look back to the history of books we know that publishers always wanted to publish books which had commercial value okay and uh, stories which came out with the real truth and all of these things uh, people really uh, they did not find the light of the printers at all so uh, but here is a um, uh, you know platform where you do not have to wait for anybody to publish your work so you see on uh, platforms like amazon where you can self publish your own books so that is what it has done today to the world of literature moving away from the print in a big big way so does that mean that print literature is not any more uh, you know interesting or attractive not at all we see the sale of books has skyrocketed today and uh, be it a ceo of a technical company or uh, be it the director of um, you know or the uh, director or principal of some educational institutions if they have a book published in their own name that is kind of a uh, status uh, symbol today okay you make your mark with the publishing of a book and uh, we still have the best sellers list and you still love to hold a book in your hand and read so we could uh, we cannot say that digital literature is the next updated form of print literature these two are completely different things okay so for all our fears that probably authors will become outdated not at all this is not going to be the story we are just going to work in sync with the machines so content creation expansion you put out a story there and people give you ideas how to uh, change it and what would be um, you know um, uh, more trendy so all these suggestions will come to you and then you have a collaborative approach in a world today which is far uh, changing into a, an individual success story of uh, sorts uh, digital literature actually forces you to be collaborative okay you have to engage with the uh, audience you have to be uh, really thoughtful of their comments and you can reach out to people who are like minded and they can work with you uh so we have a few ethical considerations like the copyright issues sometimes you have a great idea and you put it up on social media uh for a few suggestions or comments and then sometimes you have this nagging fear in your mind that what if somebody uh, just steals my idea but i think that has been the way of the world only by um you know looking and getting inspired by other ideas are we uh, surging ahead but there are a few concerns and uh, a cyber space is such a space where the laws have not been able to catch up in such a uh, you know speed as much as the cyber space is um, expanding like a universe so there is a little time before Uh, you know so today some of the journals or some of the uh, kind of uh, you know publishers who want to publish your content uh, there are methods where you can actually um, uh, you know declare the kind of ai generated content you have used so probably there will come a day wherein you will um, you know completely be allowed to have a generated content from an ai but which has completely your own signature that is your own way of working with the ai model which probably nobody can copy from you okay so this is something um, which we all feel that it is a kind of a, um, a, a you know some kind of relief you find when you think about somebody having to taken away your ideas so when you look at 
why this is happening you see uh, during the world wars okay uh, humanity like some people were so uh, devastated by the kind of harm these wars had done and seeing death and poverty and cruelty in front of their eyes some of the avant garde uh, artists you know they took a completely uh, different stand while creating these kind of uh, art pieces so we say dadaism is a moment where um, it is nothing uh, what you think about an art pieces usually we connect aesthetics with a an art piece but this was a complete departure departure from the kind of art you created so you can see here this mona lisa you know with a mush and you can see here this painting like an abstract uh, figurative painting which has just one eye okay uh, so these are some kind of theories which are uh, which help you understand why digital uh, literature is the way it is okay and um, also understanding the multimodal uh, theories today which are coming up and um, also the um, uh, you know how the medium which comes out changes the way you see and um, think about the world and the world keeps changing even before uh, like you know some governments like the north korean or the chinese governments they have to have uh, you know some kind of bans on these uh, social media platforms to prevent the um, outside culture from entering or uh, keep it heavily uh, you know uh, uh, just monitored uh, because it is such a such a powerful medium so wherein uh, some kind of these governments do not want the effects of social media seeping into their culture so this is the kind of effect uh, the media has today so when you think about digital literature you you can look at it through these various lenses whether uh, the clarity of content okay it is up to your own meaning whether it has these multimodal features okay um, and then whether the usability so you create an e poetry and name it e poetry but does it fall into all these kind of uh, things which uh, help it to explain that it is an e poetry okay whether you can navigate whether uh, whether the text is appearing differently whether you can add in something or whether you can uh, access the last verse first so all these things are uh, up to you to uh, you know look at it from a different lens uh so today um it's making its place in the world as an emerging um, cultural form okay uh you see how uh, the new kinds of uh, stories from the marginal uh, voices for example in india the um, dalit literature or the lgbtq uh, uh, you know communities they have been able to host their uh, stories online and um, uh, completely uh, bring up movements which have been so strong that uh, the legal uh, or the political establishments have had to look into it because of the sheer numbers participating in these kinds of movements so um, there is no way we can turn away from this uh, emerging cultural form so you can express yourself uh, with the uh, kind of stories and with the effects you want uh from these uh platform uh, hosted stories okay so you have your own uh, digital literature uh collection okay and it is also not the evolutionary form of print like i told you where it is very one sided like the author writes a st uh, story it is printed in the form of book and then it if you put it on a shelf and revisit the book after 10 years Uh, the it will just uh, be exactly the same book okay um vice versa uh, this kind of digital uh, literature books which are kind of on a loop you can say you can enter and exit at any time and probably grow as 
your experience also grows over the years. Okay. Uh, but one very interesting thing about digital literature is more than the people, the establishments like the MNCs, these tech companies like Amazon and Google, Adobe, Canva, etc. These are, uh, you know, somehow taking part in shaping these uh, platforms. For example, Amazon came out with a Kindle, okay, and it will uh, somehow create the structure and dictate how a story is to be read on a Kindle device, okay. So also Google or Adobe with who, uh, you know, it brings out features which you can use to create your own content. So what happens here is, you have somehow you have the corporation which is interested in these kinds of platforms. And again, like we had uh, the publishers uh, stronghold on the publishing, uh, somewhere we can see that uh, these can have a stronghold on what is actually accessible. You know how the algorithm plays out when in your search history. So these also can be manipulated. And the, the way you access, for example, if I am going to search for bags uh, and they Google knows I'm a, a you know, woman from Bangalore, the way the, the page which appears for me is completely dependent on the kind of searches I have made, my taste as opposite to somebody who would search in, let's say, in London or in Africa. So are you really accessing the information you need? Okay. Is all the information open to you or are they already manipulated to suit you without knowing that these things have been curated for you and they are somehow, uh, you know, influencing you to make decisions based on the things that they are showing to you. So the culture, the media, these are all walking uh, together and sometimes parallelly. And unless you are aware of what is happening you know, with us, we can sometimes get carried away and make choices uh, with how the information is uh, presented to us. And sometimes um, they are just behind us, you know, so that we are forced to open those links and see us. So all these things, even the kind of effects they can have, can be depicted through the artifacts you create. So um, I would say that it time will tell us how it's going to uh, change the world. Okay, the way we look at art. And today, if you see abstract art and we see the galleries, sometimes we are wondering uh, what is presented in the name of abstract paintings or abstract art. But art has to be, uh, you know, it has to be meaningful to the creator and digital literature is no stranger to this. And uh, every time the technology updates, okay, so digital literature's um, history and uh, expansion is totally dependent on the kind of technology that will support it, okay? Um, so that is one very interesting thing. There is no digital literature updation without the technological updation, okay? And if somebody does not take an active role in preserving these and even these techno technologies, uh, these, uh, however powerful uh, the artifacts were, they may be lost forever, okay? And um, the transformation that is happening, um, all of you must be really aware about, uh, you know, today, um, even uh, if you want to create an email, it can just throw you uh, an email in the matter of seconds. Imagine if you want to, uh, you know, all of us, uh, heavily came into this trend where everybody said you have to uh, tell a story uh, to win over the audience or to sell a product or you know for any kind of convincing they say you have to build in a story so you know the famous story of Tata Nano right um, sadly our um, uh, beloved hero uh, 
uh, Sri Ratan Tata has passed away. Uh, but you know the story that was created before a nano was sold. Like he saw, uh, you know, a family on a scooter and then it was raining and he felt that, you know, this family has to be able to uh, afford a car in which all of them can sit uh, without any, uh, you know, rain or any kind of things and uh, absolutely have the pressure of uh, pleasure of driving together. So this was the story created, though most people did not buy. But then uh, this is uh, what storytelling became, has been forever a powerful medium. And a digital storytelling has been even more uh, powerful these days okay so uh, if with this comes the uh, fake stories or fake things which are being created with the help of AI so a lot of things mixing and matching with this which sometimes can make it very confusing for a first time person who goes into this world okay um, and um, uh, machines are going to change the way we think uh, they have already started to because there is no denying that um, how addicted we are to information these days, right? So sometimes you want to put the phone down, but it does not allow you. Uh, so most of you would know that uh, there are uh, somebody, there is somebody called an attention engineer who works in with these social media companies uh, who change the way you scroll for these stories and the way you engage. They make it so easy like a slot machine where uh, it is very difficult to put down the device and uh, think for yourself. So uh, now we have come to that stage wherein we want information completely bite-sized and you can see these effects with the younger generation. So people are also very, very concerned about this purely digital life we are creating. And if literature was such an important um, part of our society, wherein, you know, we used to have such cathartic experiences, watching a play or reading a classic novel, will this be uh, the same, um, you know, will this have its contemporary creation in digital literature is something for all of us to uh, think about. And also, um, one more thing which people feel it is used uh, for the society for a greater benefit is a decolonization of uh, you know, the literature. Like, for example, we say how the Westerners have an influence of putting out uh, these kind of narratives in the world. But today, when you have access to your own um, digital devices and the internet, uh, you can see how we have fought with the facts. For example, um, when uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, you know, our external affairs minister, when he has a very good debate online and this video is uploaded online, anything he talks about Indian history, we immediately go and search for it and, um, you know, add it up to our own stories and we have our own experiences being shared. You can see the debates happening on social media platforms, be it our history, be it the stories which we were told or the stories which were hidden. Uh, this is taking a very, very interesting turn now for all of us. So we can look at it like a bridge, you know, which is um, a kind of um, adding to the old and the new and also looking towards the future. So we would always look at uh, the new genres and formats. This is going to happen because we have all heard about uh, these kind of stories wherein, you know, uh, you will have an AI generated movie very soon. Um, this is uh, very scary to think about. Uh, you, when an AI uh, robot, uh, you know, uh, it became a news anchor, all of us immediately, um, you know, we feel shrunk. Like, are these people going to take away all of these kind of jobs? 
So the harder it is going to make us hold on to the creative pose. Okay. So uh, it is going to be very exciting. And believe me, there is no stopping to this uh, invasive technology. We cannot say that this is going to have no presence in my world. It is going to find us. But how are we going to hold on to our places is something, um, you know, left to our choice. So uh, we could have the cross-disciplinary integration, you know, with um, other forms of uh, literature and uh, creations, <clears throat> okay? And uh, the global perspectives can also be uh, studied and it is uh, actually available to us and you could make it localized. So today you know how the Amazon ads come in. So if you are from the Hindi-speaking regions, you have the Hindi famous lines or if you are in Canada, uh, you know, Karnataka, you have the Karnataka, Canada lines coming out. So immediately, people have understood how you need to localize every experience. And this kind uh, can be some kind of a boon to digital literature, wherein <clears throat> probably even for your own family, you can have your own family album preserved in these digital artifacts. Okay. If you are somebody who wants to, um, you know, uh, save your legacy. So uh, we could have educational applications as well. Like I told you, <clears throat> students, all of us know that in the constructivist theory, um, children learn by doing. So if we want to move away from the road culture in the way we are teaching our kids, you already know that me being in a management school, you know, when I TV and we uh, are looking at placements, and all of us, uh, education is also the one which is kind of, uh, you know, uh, something which shapes our livelihood. So how do we live using education as a tool for us? So when you want to think about these things, uh, you can see that the way traditional methods of teaching students are not working anymore. They have a very, very short attention span. I don't have to, uh, you know, um, repeat all of this. You already know what is happening in the world. <clears throat> With such a small attention span, how do you tell them these complex issues and explain and talk to them for long when they are just waiting to log into their devices? Uh, now, um, all of us can be really honest and see how much, uh, you know, how tempting it is for us to just look at the notifications and get back to the to uh, talk every time. The same thing is happening to the younger generation. And um, probably if we could ask these devices to help the students think and create something creatively, you know, short kind of assignments or collaboratively work with, um, you know, other regions, other students of other places. Somehow we could find a place for their creativity uh, because today it has become an output device. If you look at the phones and the kind of platforms at host, it has become an output device where our younger generation is not putting in anything to receive information, okay? It is kind of receiving. It is the, the phone is telling them what to see, how much to see, where to search without them giving any input at all. Now, this can be a dangerous place to be in and um, all the think tanks are a little worried about where our younger generation is heading because on one side you see uh, very, very challenging creative posts and uh, creative kinds of products coming out. People have to rethink how they have to campaign these products and services. And on the other hand is a very, very traditional model of education where uh, students are not engaging enough. You see blank uh, answer sheets being given to you. You see copied um, assignments uh, which are sent to you. And somehow there is, uh, you know, there is a kind of confusion in all of us. So will the uh, creation of digital uh, literature, okay, uh, somehow um, uh, adapting it to other disciplines help us to um, make the children more hands-on is something all of us can, um, you know, give it a thought. 
So these are the codes of images which I have used. And uh, <clears throat> all of us really don't know um, that the future is on a loop. But where do we enter and where do we exit? Are we free to do so? It is all um, a big, big question today. And uh, the students are also looking for help where uh, they cannot look at us for a long time. And probably uh, it can come to our help that we help students how to um, healthily engage on these media platforms. And uh, digital literature may be one of that uh, to build their own narratives and share it uh, with the world. So I'm hoping um, we had some uh, takeaways from the talk. Um, uh, of course, there are a lot of things, but it gets very technical uh, uh, to uh, the explanations. So I thought this is something I will uh, present to you. Uh, hope um, and thank you. Thank you. Before I hope you have uh, enjoyed it or found it interesting. I thank you for the very, very patient listening and, um, you know, giving me an opportunity to share uh, this small presentation with you today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Should I thank stop you, sharing the screen? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. I'll be uh, sharing a few of the questions as well as the remarks from the participants. Thank um, you. It was a wonderful session, ma'am. Some of our participants have appreciated it. It's a very lucid presentation, informative, flowing thank presentation you. and insightful. People thank could you. relate to your content, ma'am. Thank you. And some addition has been made by Mr. Adarsh. He says, Tome AI is another AI website which is used to create PowerPoint presentation by giving just the prompts. While you are sharing your input simultaneously, yeah. Sir has shared his input. Yes. And a um, couple of observations and queries from the participants. Yeah. So Ms. Methley um, says, communication which should be simple is getting more complicated and by engaging more in digital, are we creating a counterproductive environment? So could you answer that? Um, we are, um, you know, uh, communication is actually very, very complex. So when you look at generative AI, AI the reason it came out, uh, you know, so late in the world is, for example, if I would tell you, um, my nose is running, you know, so the AI would find it so difficult uh, the machine would find it very difficult to understand uh, whether it is running in the um, literal sense. Okay, so language is very, very complex and uh, the communicative uh, abilities have to be developed in the children from a very, very young age. That is wherein, uh, you know, we as adults have to step in and see that the communicative competence of our younger generation is not washed away by these very mundane prompts which we give to the uh, generative uh, AI models, you know. So, um, but if you see one thing, communication um, is a whole new thing. If I have to discuss about it, you know, it can become another talk. But let me put it like this. So when you talk about communication, the first thing people have to understand is communication is not for us, but it is for the audience or for the other person who is listening to us. So it takes a lot of very conscious steps to form even a sentence. For example, now, uh, you know, when you told me that uh, some of your, um, or, you know, audience members have found this informative and there are a few questions, there are uh, many ways in which I can respond to you and it will depend on my experience, okay? I can very say, uh, very well say, okay, thank you, please shoot all the questions, okay? And if I'm a little cautious, I can, first of all, I can plan to say that, let me see if I can answer some of your questions. Okay, so it completely depends on you and how much you have changed as a person and you have learned in order to be able to communicate and respond to the uh, other person in front of you. So I must say that um, definitely it is becoming counterproductive, but um, there is a role in which each of us has to play in it and also evolve. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And ma'am adds to this that, you know, that we are witnessing the negative effect of too much of visual medium. Yes. So aren't we inviting a situation where some functions of the brain defunct? So. 
uh i i totally agree with you sometimes um, you know you become so loaded with information for example if you are writing a piece let's say a research paper like how many papers do you actually refer to you know you have thousands you have the elicit um uh the website you have rare uh, this a uh, uh, research rabbit all of these websites like throw up papers in hundreds okay so when do you say it is enough how much of information do you say uh, that this is enough for me to research okay so if i can if you have time i can tell you a small joke okay so yeah. what happened was uh, you know uh, these men on the wall street were uh, deciding how much money should a man make okay and uh, everybody did all the calculations and somebody said okay 10 million is the number this much uh, money we can make and be um, happy so after a while the ceo came in and asked what is the number you people uh, came up with so they said 10 million so he said make it 20 million in case you get a divorce because 10 million is going to go away <laughs> you know so uh, that is how it is okay so it is completely left uh to the kind of evolution that is happening i should say okay uh, thank you yes ma'am um uh, suparna ma'am says that how are copyright issues addressed in the context of digital humanities since creativity and productivity is assisted um like you even um, i am learning but you see that um, Uh, you know copying the ideas it always it also somehow somewhere i think it depends on a culture too uh, so if you look at uh, the study which was done i think last year we had some millions of um, research coming out of india but they say hardly a small decimal of them was really helpful for uh, you know advancing the research so we have this Uh, i think it's a matter of culture so if we can bring up this curiosity content quotient in our children if we develop that uh, probably uh, we may change the way uh, otherwise you know these copyright uh, laws and everything will be written but uh, you know we will always be smarter to beat the machine okay but i think you need a very um, good framework of your ethics and values uh so that the original um you know ideas are always uh, somehow valued and uh, ma'am adds that is there a corporate nexus inducing us to move away from published books towards digital creativity <laughs> uh not really like i told you um everybody today if you want your cv to be stronger if you have a published book which is uh, with a publisher and a hard copy i think you have uh, still more value because if you use if you say you have self published on amazon already people look at you in a different way so i think um, you know um, this worry may not sit for uh, too long yes ma'am uh, ma'am according to anthe isaac uh, could you suggest some of the digital tools to be used in the classroom um uh, see this is uh, something which is not i am not an expert in this but you have um, adobe the uh, you know um, photoshopping uh, um, software uh, but these uh, you need to work with the technical expert who can code it for you so it's not very simple some of these platforms will help you to create your own things but if you want a kind of definite result for example let's say Uh, when i'm talking to you i want my words to be um, you know the uh, highlights to be projected somewhere on the screen uh, with the kind of uh, audio which is it is able to catch then probably you need to work with these engineers to how to create you know can find a software like that so probably uh, there is one i think in your own um, conference you have dr shanmuga uh who is a digital content creator digital Moral, literature yes, creator yeah i think she will be able to give you some tools yes ma'am um so monica ma'am says as you mentioned reading digital literature and creating digital literature both are the different things so if we research on artificial intelligence does it require more knowledge of algorithms not really unless you want to you know improve the search 
uh, you should have a basic knowledge about how algorithms work. Uh, so, for example, now when I go to my Facebook page, my uh, two children somehow say that, you know, your Facebook page looks very interesting because the questions uh, you ask the machine and how you train the algorithm uh, to bring in a kind of positive, informative and, uh, you know, authentic content to your screen is somehow you can uh, actually control it. But you should definitely know how algorithms are going to manipulate you because the biggest think tags of the world are saying that the most powerful people will be the ones who create and regulate these algorithms, you know. So you should have a basic understanding about these things. Otherwise, you will get manipulated big time, I think. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Miss Karen inquires, ma'am, what are the avenues in which internet memes can be analyzed for research? Can they be considered hyper-real? Um, see, you can um, actually now sarcasm and irony, which is there in the memes today, uh, these can be analyzed to find out sentiments about a particular um, theme or an issue. For example, the elections or the education itself or, you know, any kind of, let's say, about the immigrants. So if you have to uh, look at a digital way of finding evidence for these uh, discomfort people have with these topics, uh, definitely you have uh, different methodologies like text mining, you have sentimental analysis, you have web analytics. These things can help you analyze image and text, you know, and uh, kind of res uh, reach your own results. That can be absolutely done and it is extremely interesting. Yeah, okay. and uh, it is also you can sit at your desktop and you can do the research. You know, you don't have to run around for the data. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Miss Annie Sefi says, ma'am, in this digital era, we literary people are only consumers or can be producers too. If yes, which one can be the first step? We are definitely co-creating today, right? So uh, if there is a movie... Uh, today, all of us uh, are putting up reviews and we are somehow influencing. So when we saw Kantara, uh, you can see how the whole of India decided that they will put up positive reviews and make everybody watch the movie, isn't it? So this is something you can, you are a co-creator of knowledge and information today. And definitely your participation is going to influence the way the content is created. So um, even if you do not want, uh, the death of the author has actually happened today. So you are a writer, you are a reader at all times. Uh, Ma'am, Mr. Mithun K asks, uh, like, um, if we bring, bring a physical copy of, uh, like, instead of that, uh, if we have an e-copy of the text, uh, can we bring it in digital humanities in terms of a research paper? Uh, I'm not very clear about the question. Can uh, you please if we have e-copy of a physical book, yeah, can he bring it in digital humanities field for research paper? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not very clear about the question. Um, see, a scanned thing is not yeah. considered as a digital content. So um, if I scan, uh, let's say, uh, Shakespeare's uh, or the Great Expectations, okay, and uh, put it up uh, in digital humanities, it will not be called as a digitally um, created content, okay? It is still a scanned copy, like a PDF. So these mm -hmm. are not considered as digital creations, okay? Research on it, probably it will help you research because you can find through the platforms today, libraries, you can f you can have an access to these scanned copies, which will help you in your research. Okay. And you have different software, which can help you find word clouds from these kind of um, e-papers or e-books. So there can be OCRs, you know, these, uh, you have the Google OCR. Uh, you can use these to scan your uh, texts and uh, pick up these kind of words, which can help you, uh, you know, further research your uh, uh, themes or uh, whatever topics you are working on. This can be done. Uh, Ma'am, according to, um, just a second. Yeah, Anthea, um, 
we are making videos online. So is it only the way to make digital content for people? Like people who are not quite well versed with digital, digital media, technical aspects. Is it only through the aspect of video or there are other things also which would work for them? See, that's why I told you like um, how corporations have come into this. Okay. They have made a few technologies very easy. For example, somebody who cannot read and write. Okay. You can look at reels at night. Uh, you have people uh, who are selling vegetables or who are farmers who cannot read or write English. They have made content which has, uh, you know, helped them break through the language barrier. Okay. Without any language, you are able to produce a video. So what happens with people is whichever is easier to use and whichever can be manipulated by them, that is what will come into use. If you have to create uh, writing pieces, okay, a actually sentences and words, uh, it is more of a work. But definitely, you will find an audience for that, okay? And uh, like if you have really heartfelt um, memoirs or uh, stories or poems which you are writing and you have still the audience for such kind of pieces, definitely, yeah. yeah. We'll take a few more questions. Yeah. Uh what kind of methodology can be used in archiving in digital humanities? An example is given as Bichitra project. Yeah, so you should have these, um, uh, you know, um, platforms. Like I told you about the electronic literature organization. Mm -hmm. If you can read them um, and access their website, it will uh, tell you how they are trying to store these uh, obsolete technologies. Some of them are lost forever. But um, uh, probably save a few of these softwares um, and uh, still uh, they should be programmable uh, to preserve these kind of artifacts. I don't know. I'm not very sure if um, all of them can be uh, preserved and archived. Uh, but definitely you can access their website and uh, you will have more information. And uh, you can also ask uh, Dr. Shanmuga or Dr. Nirmala Menon for more on this, okay? They are actually uh, really good people um, who have worked a lot on creation. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, um, there's a question by Rajin. He says, you know, if everybody is using AI to write digital content, will it not be copyright infringement? Yeah, it is. But you know what? Uh, even if you re uh, look at college students, uh, they have come up with AI models which write in their own handwriting, okay? Uh, and they have learned how to uh, beat the Turnitin uh, software. So, at definitely, you know, there is nothing which can beat a human brain, actually. If you become a little creative, you know how to use AI, uh, you know, chat GPT, and um, to bypass these kind of uh, softwares. It can be done. <laughs> So it's a little dangerous, but I should accept that it is possible. Okay. We'll take the last question for the day. Uh, Ms. Angita Mishra says, could you suggest, she's uh, taking your suggestion, that could you suggest uh, a topic uh, which could be related to digital humanities and literature? See, digital humanities is an umbrella where one is uh, computation comes in. Another thing is digital literature. And one more thing is archiving all of this, okay? So, digital humanities is a whole lot of things. And um, it is much bigger. Digital literature is a small subset of digital humanities, okay? And there are numerous, numerous things. You can look at digital libraries in India. You can look at how we are preserving our own culture and our stories or artifacts like pictures. Anything can be a topic. It is just wide, I'm telling you, uh, I'll give you a small suggestion. Uh, you subscribe to ChatGPT 4.0 model for a month and you search your questions in it. I'll tell you how amazing the search engine is. You will never be able to find these things on Google. Okay, so um, subscribe together uh, with your friends for with 2000 a month, I think one month you can subscribe and all of these kind of suggested topics and uh, the kind of websites and the kind of softwares you need to the methodologies, everything it will throw up 
and it is such a powerful um, search engine better better than google you can do that and probably uh, make a good um, uh, you know folder and use it later Yes, ma'am. And somebody's added. If you could throw light on archiving, there was a previous question also. Like, um... uh, yeah. What I meant by archiving is, or uh, these uh, generations. Uh, you know, I told you about three generations of digital literature, uh, which uh, they have created uh, these kind of digital artifacts. and they are archived by some institutions okay it is not possible for me like if i'm working on a pc i may not be able to archive this kind of digital content which has been created by using uh, an an old software okay so you will need the help of uh, some kind of a sponsorship uh, to archive all of these things okay for example today i you may your institution jain may have a recording of zoom okay after let's say 2 3 years if zoom goes bankrupt and uh, if we do not have access to these videos and if the software does not play the video anymore a zoom recording anymore on the system then they are lost forever right but to preserve that kind of a technology you need some kind of resources like how we need um, funds for r&d the same way you need some sponsorship to have these archiving uh, platforms oh, thank you thank you ma'am and uh, some of the participants had requested for your email id that they can have an extensive discussion with you yeah um, uh, i'll just put it up here yes ma'am um i should say i have enjoyed a lot uh, i had this worry if i would not be relevant to you people <laughs> and uh, sometimes i go off uh, you know zone into a teacher who is teaching the students in the class so thank you so much for a very patient listening i hope i was of some use and kindled some curiosity in you and thank you dr priya you've been really kind coordinating Thank, Thank you, you for the lovely, lovely opportunity. <laughs> you made my day, all of you. Such lovely comments. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I loved being here too, and um, you know, sharing this with you all. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so, as we conclude day two of our FDP, on yeah. behalf of the organizing committee and participants, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Ms. Radhika Ramesh. for delivering such an engaging and thought provoking session ma'am we thank you for accepting our invitation at the last minute thank you your valuable insights have greatly enhanced our understanding and will benefit us in our future endeavors um right now i request all the participants to switch on the videos for a group photograph shall i remove my headset for a uh, for the photo yes <laughs> it should be done i think yes ma'am thank you have a lovely evening everybody and thank you, you to dr priya thanks for thank the great you, great opportunity thanks to jane and uh, dog thanks to dr yashaswini and all of them doc uh, i think uh, ms jayashri also who got in touch with me thank you all so much have a nice evening <laughs> participants please note that that feedback link has been posted in the chat box kindly fill out the feedback form feedback form before logging out Uh, please keep in mind filling the feedback form is mandatory for the certification um it will be active for 30 minutes um dear participants we look forward to welcoming welcoming you tomorrow again for another enriching uh, session by dr shanmuga priyati and her topic is introduction to text mining and the timing is from 3 pm to 5 pm until then take care and have a great evening ahead thank you thank, thank you, you. bye bye thank you जय श्री मैम